Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let's slowly but surely start the session. It's still, uh, it's still early, and we have a, a bit of buffer with the previous session, but um, let's start. Uh, welcome to the third and the last day of the RNI days. My name is Viral Pekka. I'm the head of unit of emerging uh, technologies, future and emerging technology in the European Commission. I have the pleasure to moderate this session. Um, we start, uh, we start uh, the day with a very exciting, and I would dare to say important topic for Europe and for research and innovation, IP. And in my opinion, it's also a sort of um, Achilles heel for, for Europe. Um, so we have gathered for you, uh, to help you in this journey, three top experts and responsible for uh, three important aspects. So we start the day with Spela Stress, uh, head of the Center of Technology Transfer and Innovation at Josef Stefan Institute in Slovenia. And Spela will tackle head-on the dilemma to publish or to perish, to be or not to be. Let's see if she can help you to in a sort of have the cake and eat it, but this time for real. So we continue then with uh, Jörg Schrerer, who has over 20 years experience in providing IP uh, consultancy and support services. And Jörg is the founder and managing director um, of the European Research and Project Office. Um, he will give you some tips and best practices about licensing but also an overview about the services that the IPR help desk can provide to the research and innovation in Horizon 2020. Last but not least, Sharon Shamulia will discuss with you about protecting your software through patents or other IPR uh, instruments like copyright and dual licensing. Sharon has a PhD in semiconductor physics and uh, is a licensed patent attorney and has uh, a lot of experience working in technology transfer and she is with uh, our GRC or Joint Research Center. I invite you to make the most of this, uh, of this last day of RNI days and please do not forget, down to, uh, not forget to write down your question for the Q&A session at the end. Without further ado, Spela, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. So I will try to tackle the title, how to decide for publication or patenting. Of course, uh, the researchers always ask themselves whether to publish or to perish. And I did that myself. Uh, I used to be a researcher. I have a PhD in physics, and then I switched to more economical and legal waters. Um, as a patent attorney, I started to ask myself whether the publish or perish question is actually important for the researcher, because I would have asked that question differently. I would have asked whether to publish or to patent. In that respect, it's very important to understand that patenting is complicated and there are all sorts of even stupid things that the inventors could do. The inventors could um, either come up with an invention that nobody wants it or they're unrealistic about the, the, the value of the invention. They might um, not have fully considered the problem that they're addressing and stuff like this. The next thing is that patenting is also very expensive. So if you want to patent an invention, let's say all over the world, in an approximation of all over the world, you might come up with having to pay a sum close to half a million of dollars, and that's just not feasible. So it takes a lot of decision making to patent correctly. First of all, patenting should be done for the market. There's a value chain from engaging an academic and engaging, um, building a relationship with the companies, and there's a lot of stuff to be done in between. And in the end, you might even find out that the industry does not want the real patent. They're, they would rather go for publications, informal connections, conferences, consulting, contract and collaborative research. They might even prefer to hire your colleague. The patents and the licenses, they found themselves relatively low on the 
wish list of the industry, but still there is a situation in which you need to patent, but you always need to understand that you're in a position of technological uncertainty while you're doing that, meaning that you're investing cash. The cash flow is always negative at the point where you're deciding on patenting. And when you protect, when, when you actually patent a technology, you're still just investing. There's, there, there might be years to the income, profit, or even break-even point. So it's important to have some kind of a strategy and to understand what your options are. There are categories of knowledge that every researcher is well aware of. This belongs to the copyright. Researchers understand everything about scientific papers, the posters on conferences and stuff like this. Some researchers understand that the patents don't give you the sole right to obtain the money because you might not earn anything from a patent at no particular time in the future, but it does give you the right to exclude others in case you're capable of earning some money from the patent. Some people are not completely or fully aware of the fact that there, there is a special category which is important in, in research. You might not be interested in patenting everything that is patentable, so you might decide to keep it as a secret know-how. So there are different ranges how you can keep an invention secret from deciding that the people that you work with need to keep it secret with certain commitments through NDAs. You can protect your databases or you can restrict access to the data in labs. But ultimately, the most formal way to protect your IP is through patents, trademarks and design rights. So, to publish or to patent, you need to answer three questions. Is the thing that you've got, your technology, is it, is, does it have commercial potential? Secondly, is it patentable? And thirdly, is it worth patenting? Are you willing to invest that much money into it? You need to make some order out of those questions, so they should be asked one after another. And Firstly, you ask yourself whether the thing you've got, your technology, has a commercial potential, and if yes, then you try to check whether it's patentable, if it's new, inventive, and industrially applicable. And then, if it is patentable and it does have commercial uh, potential, then you ask yourself whether it's worth patenting for you. Do you have enough money? How is it about the infringements you might encounter? And then if you answer all this positively, then you file your patent. And then you publish your scientific article. So it's not to publish or to patent. You can do both. You just need to answer certain questions and you need to do it in a particular order. And all these questions might be answered in a rather short way if you've got uh, professional support to do it with you, together with you. Obviously, these questions are not so simple, and um, you might even answer all of them negatively, and then you would go directly to pu publishing your scientific article. So, in commercial potential, you would ask yourself about the, the market, what size of the market there is for your technology, how mature your technology is, what's the TRL technology readiness level of your technology. Are there any synergies with existing industry or are you building a new industry? So if you are convinced that this, you've, you've got positive answers, you can also then go to the next step. These are just uh, information on patentability by WIPO and you, you can get uh, specific support from different organizations, from patent attorneys or from um, even from IPR help desk regarding these issues. And in the last, if, you, if it's worth patenting, then you, you need to know what the costs of the patent protection are going to be. And that depends on the scope, on the geographical scope that you're going to file the patent in. But you also need to know whether 
that particular patent fits into your patent portfolio, so you'll be capable of doing something with it. In any case, if you decide to patent or if you don't decide to patent, you can still keep the knowledge, even, even though it's patentable, as a secret know-how. And in any case, you can, if you file a patent, you can sell or license a patent. If you don't file a patent, you can still sell your secret know-how if it's proper, properly pr protected. And if you don't do neither of those, you can still sell your skills to the industry in terms of contract and collaborative research. So there are, there's a myriad of options how you can co co cooperate with the industry and um, the next speakers will tell you more about that. I will just say that it's important to understand that every partner has got their background IP, they invest money and work into the project and once the project starts something happens. They generate, generate the foreground IPR and then you've got the l many sorts of negotiations on how the background IP would be used, who should use the foreground IPR and it depends on the different types of agreements which I think York is going to go more into the details afterwards. I'll just go briefly through um, three of them, the non-disclosure, you've got two partners, they've both got background IPR and they decide to work together. They don't come up with anything new, they just decide that they would exchange some IPR among themselves. Collaboration agreements, they decide, the, both partners come into the process with background IPR, they both invest energy and money and something happens, new IPR is generated that might belong to one, to another, or could be joined by the two partners. And then again, they need to negotiate what and how to do with the, the foreground IPR. IP licensing agreement, the two partners, they both got background IPR, but one of them would want to use the background IPR of the other, and they would invest money and energy to do something with it and they need access rights to do something with the background IPR of the others. I'll just skip the material transfer agreements for now. I like this picture, this scheme very much because it shows how the research can get transmitted into the last column, the economic impact. So research it's not there just an isolated island. In the end, throughout some very difficult and long-term decision makings and interactions, new jobs, new products, new services should come out. And where the researchers and the industry collaborate is in the blue column in the middle through collaborative research, contract research, licensing and spin-out formation which we will also hear more about later on. So if you have a public research organization that owns either patents, secret know-how or scientific articles and you've got a company that is in need of them, you can make the company aware and then you can transfer the knowledge to the company in different ways. If you've, got, if you've got the IPR, you can license it to the company. If the company's got a problem that needs to be solved, you can enter a contract and collaborative research agreement. And if there is a very specific s amount of knowledge that should be given a chance to perform the process from the idea to the product itself, then you should allow your researchers to create a new company, a spin-out company. So there are different sorts of collaborations that you can carry out even with the non-patentable knowledge, consulting services, technical cooperation, rental of staff, joint national and EU project applications. Licensing can Licensing and um, sales of patents, of know-how, can only be done if you have something that is either patentable or uh, kept as a secret know-how. And obviously, in this maze of options, you need to have a lot of support to do it. 
it is complicated. So if you ask yourself, should you do it by yourselves? My strong belief is that expert support is important. And there are many people around that would either queue to criticize the system or queue on to propose what to do. But the ones you need are the ones that queue to do it. There are not very many of those. But in any case, the research organizations usually have TTOs and the researchers might contact them. Even the people from the industry might contact the technology transfer offices. There is uh, an association of science and technology professionals which you might decide to contact if you don't know whom to contact in your country. The TTO circle is um, a company of the high level research organizations in Europe that has been built under the, the kind uh, leadership of JRC and we also have a representative of JRC here today. There's the IPR help desk that might give you an assistance and we also have a speaker today from the IPR help desk. There's the Enterprise Europe network that spans all around Europe with more than 600 member organizations. You could contact them. There you could also get some assistance from EPO or national patent offices and obviously the patent attorneys, but those would not work for you for free. So technology commercialization is complicated and you would need support in that. But going back to the beginning, IP is, even if you don't decide to patent, IP is a very valuable source of information. That's a really millions of publications that you can check and see whether your research is going the right way. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I would say it's not publish or perish, but it's publish or patent. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Spela. Jörg, tell us more about licensing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Spella, also for the very first introduction of the European IP helpers and big thank to you that the early birds who joined this uh, very morning session. And uh, I would like to start with a question. Is, um, as I'm a representative or the coordinator of the European IP helpers, who already knows the European IP helpers or, or received some of the services? Uh, it's rather half of the people. So I will do a very short, brief introduction also at the very end of the presentation. So how the European IP helps could be of support for you. So um, I'm reflecting more on the topic uh, with regard to, um, let's say, what is the value of IP management or licensing or IP management in general uh, in the context of a European funded project, particularly a collaborative project. I mean, we know about the European Innovation Council projects, we know about the proof of concept for the ERCs, but still uh, a big chunk um, of, the, of the money and the budget of Horizon 2020, and it will also be the case for Horizon Europe, is spent in the framework of collaborative research. And also from the European added value, we see that collaborative projects, which brings together partners from SMEs, from startups, from research organizations, from universities, from, many, from big corporates together in the framework of different collaborative research projects. Of course, it's a big source of sharing information, sharing values, and of course, to develop new innovative products and services. And from the IP helpers, we know that being involved in such collaborative projects, there are a lot of questions. And there are even fears. There are even SMEs say, okay, I mean, why should I go into such a new collaboration? I don't know the partners. I might even risk to lose something of my knowledge because I need to share. And they have to understand, yeah, what are, they, what are let's say, the principles of collaboration in the framework of European projects. And that's what, what we see then in the different services we offer from the help desk, like our helpline. And we see that people are struggling also with the different terms. Like, I mean, they have when they go into a project, they have to indicate what is their background. Not only the protected, the IPR, but also what is the IP? What is the knowledge they would like to bring on the table? But here you could do, even the very first mistakes, that you can narrow down it in a way that's not enough really to have a fertile ground for our licensing or for other kind of collaboration later, or you are too big to open and that might also bear some risks that there is an exchange in a way you would like to have it later. 
And then also we talk about the results, which used to be, or it referred to be foreground in, in the previous framework programs, which means you are, you are developing something new. And then the question is on the table, who is the owner of the results? How to share the results? And then, of course, there is a need to exploit the results, to disseminate the results, and to grant access rights. And then it's this, of course, it's very closely related to licensing. Who is going to get access to your results? What are the, the things you need to do, and what are your options to do it in favor for further uh, market penetration or commercial exploitation? And ownership is a very fair thing. Mo quite in the helpline, we receive about four to five questions a day. Uh, related to running projects or new applications, and ownership is on the top of the list. We see really uh, that people say, okay, now I'm in a collaborative project, and I would like to know who exactly is the owner of the results. And of course, uh, due to the nature of collaborative projects, we also look at um, joint ownership. And they ask for, is there a way, um, what is, or let's say, what, what is the general rule, like it is written in the grant agreement or in the consortium agreement, is there any default rule, or what are our opportunities to shape ownership in a way that it fits the best to our exploitation plans. And that can be done already in the proposal stage or in the consortium agreement, and that can be followed up later. So, of course, I mean, and whenever you look at the, making a deal with an investor or looking for any kind of collaboration agreements or licensing agreements, ownership is always a very big issue because investors want to know who is going to represent the consortium. And we see still being invited for pitching events, for example, from uh, Horizon projects coming to an end, that they have a clear idea about the, let's say, um, the let's say the value proposition of their technology, but it, when it comes, what is a clear ownership rule? They still have questions. They know this is something we still struggle. We are not sure who is going to work and what is the right structure. For example, you could even think about an IP holding or developing a new company or to make regulations using licensing uh, uh, contracts. So you see, ownership is definitely something which is not coming by nature. You, you have to deal with that and you have some uh, uh, good, good examples like uh, I'm sure you can also find in the tech transfer office. And that's, again, something which, which we need to emphasize on, that when it comes really uh, to develop it, an exploitation strategy, m might even happen in the proposal stage or, or then later, um, you take those people from the tech transfer people in the team. And so the, the, the basic rules are, I mean, you share free, freely the information during the project implementation. But when it comes to... Um, agree on the use of results beyond the project duration, particularly for the commercialization of the results, then of course it's, it's negotiation. It's, it's a deal. And among not all the consortium members usually, so among the individual consortium members who are going to exploit the results and the other ones are going to use it, or you involve third parties which are interested to take the results of the project. And then, of course, there is always a mix-up. We see that, that people think about, I mean, we didn't file a patent in the project, so actually we don't have IP. There is no IP in the, in the project. So, but mixing up IP and IPR, I mean, of course there is IP. There are intellectual assets, there are results, there is knowledge, and you have to develop an IP strategy. And in any Horizon project, uh, you need to draft uh, a plan for the dissemination exploitation of results, which means your IP. Of course, there could also be IPR, but IPR is a tool to protect your IP and even more to support the commercial exploitation of the assets. And that's a thing that has been said already and it's going to be said again. Uh, IPR is not something we need to, to just to take it because it's going, and we'll come to that, it might be reimbursable by the project. However, it's really, it should always be part of a uh, sophisticated exploitation strategy, not just to protect and then to see. Because we see, and there are studies on that, that many IPRs, uh, filed in the framework of European projects were not maintained after the project duration was over because there was no strategy behind and there was no real business case for that. It was just to do it because um, you, you had the opportunity uh, to make use of some of the project funds um, to take a type of IP protection. We do not look into the different IP titles uh, they were presented and we will have a more closer look at this uh, in the context of software protection later. Uh, so, But really this is also something we keep in mind. European projects are a good, a good, good way even um, to, let's say, to uh, cover some of the costs 
which are related to IP protection and tech transfer. People are, are always very happy to see that there are some grants available or funds available uh, to make use of. And in particular for startup companies, uh, it's good to see that costs related um, to patent search, costs related uh, to file a patent and registration fees can be charged to the project to the extent possible. It's not that, I mean, you have an, you file a patent for whatever with a lifetime of 20 years that you can charge the registration cost for the 20 years to a project running for three years, but for the lifetime of the project you can do. Or even you have an existing patent, which is the basis for a technology which you're going to use in the Horizon project, you can charge the costs for maintaining the, the patent for this year's due to the project in a specific percentage of usage for the project. So and this is, I think this is important to see. Actually, there are five pillars of IP management in any uh, collaborative project. So first, you look at the IP used by the project, which is the, the background. And of course, any partner have to indicate uh, what is the, the knowledge, the IP, the intellectual assets they contribute to the project, and of course that's the basis also for the evaluation of your proposal that you have been selected because you have a track record, you have experiences, you have some IP which you bring into the new collaboration. But again, here there might also be problems, and we see, for example, that you might infringe the IP of others. We've seen that, for example, that some of the projects are follow-up projects from previous collaborations, and you develop the database in the previous projects, and then you take the database further on in the next project, but you change the consortium, and then, of course, then problems started. So you have to be sure that you have the right to make use of the, of the IP, maybe, then from uh, which you bring in as a background. IP generated by the project, which, is, which, are, which are the results, how to capture it, how to disclose it, how to manage ownership, and of course, how to organize it in the consortium. It means, for example, do you have an IP committee or have you somebody who will take a look at are there pre-publication reviews? So if there's somebody goes to a conference, presents a paper, is, this, is there a mechanism? For example, it says that we could say that uh, we usually send 45 days before going to a conference our presentation to the partners to have a look at it, and if they have objections, because they see there might be some IP in it which they would like um, to protect prior to publication, then they can have a veto on that. That's very important. It looks to be very simple, but we still see many problems and cases because this has not been properly done. And then, of course, IP assessment. What is the value of it? I mean, it's a very tricky question. And you are not, of course, but there are something we see already, for example, in those financial instruments or programs in, uh, in Horizon 2020, which are very close to market like fast track to innovation or the, in the SME instrument. It says already in the guide for applicants, you should include a kind of an FTO, which means really to look at it, what might be potential, let's say, applicability of my IP, what are other IPs which might block or provide barriers to the use of my IP, and that's something you could also do in the project and uh, that it's a proper uh, project activity. And then, of course, IP protection and later on, of course, um, to disseminate and to exploit the results uh, through different um, exploitation pathways. And so then still see what are the next things which should happen and have to happen in order to be successful with your go-to-market strategy. Are there any further barriers or enablers like standards? Standards, or you can work with standards essential patents or still a way to bring your, your uh, technology uh, closer to market and to have a well-established um, market as you are compliant to those standards. But still we see that many of the results developed in the project are early stage. So they need an upscaling, a proof of concept, they need or demonstration in order to convince somebody who would like to get access to the results. And it's all about convincing other people that your technology your results are worth um, to spend further investment on. And this is then the, the question here is then, okay, what is the best way to go? And of course, there are many pathways, it's, and it's up to you. It's up to you to decide which is the best for my, for my project results. I mean, there are the more the soft ones, which we say, okay, I think it's difficult to read, like the use for further research, the use for teaching, the use for policy use, but also, I mean, there is licensing or joint ventures, and there are startups, and there are, of course, advantages and disadvantages for all of those models. And um, for example, if you look at, an option to start a new company. I mean, of course, then 
a lot needs to be done. So at least, I mean, you need a, a critical mass of expertise, and of course, you need the right people, which are very committed and very enthusiastic. And of course, your technology should be somehow disruptive, revolutionary, and um, it's entering maybe a new market. And then a startup would be the best option um, for your go-to-market strategy. And of course, then you need capital, so it's a high risk, high gain adventure, and returns, uh, and you need a little of patience maybe also for returns. So licensing could be another option, and it's still, I would say, the most, the most common option, uh, because you can take advantage of a licensee which knows about the market, which has the expertise, the resources, and it's already operating. So it's uh, really, and you can even address with your licensing or smart licensing strategy uh, different fields of use or different geographical areas. So you enter quickly an existing market, even with, an, let's say, an incremental technology improvement. And of course, the, the question here is how to find, how to find the right licensee, which then UIP might fit into the gaps of this, of of the portfolio. And that's, again, what has been stand by Speller. There are also other mechanisms in place which are supported by the European Commission, like the Enterprise Europe Network, which might help you to find uh, a potential licensee for your uh, project results. And, of course, it, it has the advantage that at the beginning there are low financial uh, commitments and you might get some, let's say, slow uh, or, let's say, lower um, start-up or front-up payments, but it could grow in the, in the past, and it's still a very safe opportunity for bringing uh, results to the market. So there are any kind of license types which you can use, of, could be more non-exclusive licenses, exclusive licenses, or cross-licensing, and I mean the advantages of the non-exclusive licenses is that you can spread the risk of commercialization by entrusting several licenses or companies. However, in practice we see that uh, often licensing takes us as a precondition um, that they get an exclusive license in order to gain a competitive lead. I mean, uh, looking from the perspective of European projects, there are all options are open. It's up to you. There's one, there is one limit. There's one limit that you cannot assign the IP or you cannot provide an exclusive license to a licensee which is outside Europe. And that might, might be a problem in some of the technology areas like quantum technologies, where you have the big corporates, for example, outside Europe. But be, this is then, in this case, you need to ask for the permission of the commission. In any other cases, you do not ask for, for the permission. So what are the five, let's say, the most important ingredients of a licensing agreement? First, what are the parties? What is the win-win situation? What is the IP right behind the patent, trademarks? trade secret, um, you describe the scope of the license as for manufacturing, uh, for distribution or production purposes. And of course, you talk about the financial side. Is it, what are the upfront payments? What, uh, how you work with lump sums? Uh, maybe also linked to specific milestones, royalties and so on. So, and of course, uh, we have a lot of information on that also on the website of the, of the IP help desk. So that brings me to the two last slides, which is that what, are the services the European IP help desk could offer to you. So it's a, first of all, it's a free of charge service, it's, so you do not have to pay anything for that. So we have a helpline, and for all your questions, you get an answer within three days. But also we have a lot of publications in a non-legal style, so written in the layman style, which are easy to understand. Uh, we have training, we have specific webinars also focusing on, on licensing and IP commercialization. And if you're uh, a multiplayer, you can even get in contact with us to see that we organize a specific online or uh, on-site training uh, for you um, on those different topics which are um, which you can find on our website as well. So, and last but not least, there are a couple of publications which are also linked to the topic. There is a brochure about how to make the most of your Horizon 2020 project, how to boost exploitation, what is the guide to IP in Horizon, or specific guides about commercialization or contract and, and IP. So thank you very much. I mean, there are many ways to get in touch with us, and uh, I'm still here, and if you have any questions, I'm very happy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shannon. Please enlighten us about software and protection. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Right. 
Um, first of all, um, we only have 15 minutes, and there's a lot to say about software protection and also uh, licensing models linked to software. So I will not deep dive on a lot of the topics, but just give you an overview and a grasp of what is possible, what to look for. Uh, and as my colleagues already said before me, um, look to spe specialists if you really want to know uh, what to do with the elements you've seen today as well. So introduction to IPRs, you've heard a lot of them already um, um, taken over here. Um, very important here, it's um, an intellectual property right, is a right given to person which is first of all an exclusive right. That means a negative right. So it's a right for you to say, no, you're not allowed to use my um, IP that I generated, but it's not a positive right. So what do I mean with that? It doesn't automatically give you the right to put it on the market. And that's the freedom to operate that uh, my colleagues were mentioning as well. Now, you have two main areas in IPRs. Uh, one of them is copyright and the rights related to copyrights. And the other one are the industrial property rights. Now, traditionally, the the copyright was more used for um, the cultural uh, applications, but now with digitalization, it is also now referred to, to uh, source code and, and such going forward. And also very important, uh, copyright is something you automatically get. You don't have to do something specifically for it. It's there from the moment that you create something creative, um, which is expressed um, specifically, you have copyright protection. It doesn't mean that if you put a C, you know, that you get the copyright, it's there anyways. The C just tells people, remember, I have a copyright, just don't copy paste without thinking. And also other industrial properties like patents, you have to file, you have to do something to get that protection, as for trademarks, for example. Um, as I was mentioning, um, copyright um, is uh, provided for an ex a creative expression. So what is expression? It's not an idea. It's a specific implementation of an idea. That's very important, definitely for software. That means that the, the logic, the algorithm, and the programming languages comprising the ideas are not protected by copyright. Only the specific implementation of an of a algorithm which is there. Now, uh, what you can also say here, you have the database rights. It's very uh, straightforward. It's giving to uh, a collection of independent works, data, or autom other materials arranged in a systematic or methodological way. Um, and also, it's there, the rationale is there to actually protect the investment made to make that database as well. Now, as I said, copyright is only for the specific implementation of an idea, of an algorithm, but the algorithm itself can be protected by a patent. Because every time I say that, everyone is like, yeah, but patents aren't protectable in Europe. They are protectable, but there are specific specifications linked to them. Thresholds you have to overcome. And actually, at the EPO, they have a very, very, very uh, big history already of software patents. They're very well averse of what to do when they have a patent application in front of them. And actually, how they look at it is, OK, um, the European Patent Convention says you get a patent, if for everything which is applicable in a technical field, which is an invention, which is novel, has an inventive step, and is industrial applicable. Um, for um, the co programs for computers, they say you cannot patent something which is a software as such. But a lot of people say, what is as such? We don't understand that. So actually they say, look, it is an invention if it has a technical character and produces a further technical effect. And then after you have the definition, okay, it is an invention, they further look at, is it novel and is it inventive? And how do they look at that? It's actually, I've provided some examples. Um, for it to be an invention, it actually is a very low threshold to overcome. Um, there is a very specific uh, landmark case law of the European uh, Patent Office which says if you provide uh, a device, like for example a computer, or a computer readable de device, sorry, or you put it's a computer implemented method, you already overcome that threshold of it being having a technical character. As you can see, the first one is excluded from patentability um, because it doesn't have a technical character, but the two other examples are not excluded, excluded from patentability. 
because why well, you have a computer with a database and you have the mentioning of a computer implemented method. Now, this is very low threshold, and as you can see, um, the description of the claims have a combination of technical elements and non-technical elements. And that's actually the second uh, element which will be um, evaluated, which is, is it non-obvious? Does it have an inventive step? And uh, normally at the European Patent Office, it's like an algorithm they follow. It's a problem-solution approach. It is, uh, what's the technical problem? How is it solved? And what kind of technical advantages do, does my invention bring? And is it uh, non-obvious? That means if I look to everything which has been published before filing, um, could I have come to that uh, invention on myself? So here you can see only those parts of the features that uh, make a contribution to the technical character are considered in that problem and solution approach. So it means that even though you have maybe an invention, it still is not um, inventive enough to go and get a patent. So these are the two elements you have to overcome to obtain, um, a, I would say, a computer implemented invention or a software patent. But again, it is patentable software uh, if you uh, provide your uh, technical contributions. Now, uh, why I put trade secret here as well? Because this is something which has been used a lot with softwares. Why? Because not everyone provides their source code, for example, because a lot of the, I would say, golden eggs of a product are, are uh, considered there as well. Now, trade secrets is not an intellectual property right. You cannot use a trade secret to block others from using that IP that you protected. But the trade secret provides you an IP protection for trade secret misappropriation. So that means that someone has unlawfully um, accessed your IP, which is protected by trade secrecy, then you have a fallback. But of course, there are requirements that you have to overcome until it is seen as a trade secret. I would say this um, description, I've taken this from the IPR help desk. So uh, a lot of information which you see here, they also have very nicely described in their help sheets. Now, um, when I'm talking about copyrights and patents and trade secrets, um, a lot of people that I meet, they're like, you know what, my software, it's uh, behind, our, uh, behind the firewall, no one will see it. I'm just gonna um, go for trade secrecy. Um, only people have access to the interface, I'm not gonna open it, but look at Interplay. We have the GDPR, of course, everyone knows it now. <laughs> uh, there, you, you have the principle of explainability. So you have to think, okay, uh, maybe I have a strategy of taking everything and putting it as a trade secret, but there are regulations that I have to comply to. And also very important, I've put the CE marking there as well. If you, for example, have medical software that needs CE marking, you have to provide some information, sometimes accessible to third parties, to show that your medical software is doing what you promised it to do. So again, very important, you have IP protection but also it has to be aligned with what you're doing, what your product is, what are you doing, put on the market as, as well. And also very important, um, the difference between patent protection and copyright. So let's say, as I said, copyright does not protect the ID behind it, the algorithm, but if it's patentable, the algorithm has patent protection. What does that mean? That means that even though that you have patent protection, it can be, um, even though you have copyright protection, sorry, it can be that you can't put it on the market because the algorithm has been protected by a patent. That's why I was saying about it's an exclusive right. It's not a positive right. Uh, but, of course, with software patents, a lot of it is a black box. Infringement and enforceability is very important because how can you know that someone is infringing your patent? So there's other risk elements to consider as well. Now, looking further, a lot of my colleagues have mentioned this as well. Um, freedom to operate. There is one, the element of third party rights you have to look for, like patents with respect to copyright you want to put on the market, but also contractual rights. And a very important one here is data. Um, a lot of people provide consent to use their data for research only, 
but not for exploiting that, that data that they provided. So every time um, we used to get a software uh, package that needed to be exploited, we needed to check, one, do we know the owners? One, do we know who worked on the, on, on the software? Two, what kind of data did they use? Did they have the consent to use that data? And what kind of consent was that? Only research, commercialization, both or not? So it has a lot of elements you have to consider to be able to exploit in, in a correct way going forward. Now, contracts, as a lot of people here said, very important. The clarity of contracts is, is important. Know what you're licensing. Is it exclusive, non-exclusive, in a specific field? Um, what are you going to uh, do? You, if you're going to provide exclusive license, then only that person can use that, that IP. No, do you want something back to maintain your freedom to operate when you're doing research, for example? And now, also important is what is transferred. So it can be that you own the IP, as I said, but you can't put it on a market because you don't have the right access rights because you can be blocked even if you own an IP. It's not, it's not a ticket for you to put it on the market. Now, also very important for those who are not in, uh, not in um, the university and, and the research institutes, employment contracts. Because depending on the country you are, ownership during uh, an invention that you do for your boss could not be protected. So that's something that you have to link and see, okay, where is the IP generated? Do we have ownership? Can I put it on the market? If I don't have ownership, what to do? Even in universities, this is an issue. For example, if you have uh, master students. Normally, like for example, in Belgium, there's a decree, but master students don't fall under that decree. So that means if you've written a code together with a master student, or you use that master student to do part of your work, you have that uh, element of ownership that is going to be divided. Now, looking at software licensing models, this is a high-level approach, again. Um, you really have to choose the right uh, model in function of your strategy again. So this is something that you'll hear a lot from me as well today. Uh, why? Because it depends what you want to do with it. And depending on your future plans to see, okay, uh, do I want to have proprietary licensing or am I going to open source my, my software or am I going to go for dual licensing? Now, I'm gonna deep dive in the, in the three models. So proprietary software licensing is actually software that is licensed by the copyright holder. So again, very important, only copyright holder. So if you have worked together, you have to see that you agree um, intra-parties what you're gonna do with the code and if the other party is also happy with what you want to do. And you can um, license it under specific conditions and various licensee obligations. For example, you restrict the licensing's uh, ability to modify the software or relicense it. You can restrict the uh, ability to inspect the source code or to reverse engineer it. It's actually a kind of a, a free license um, agreement that you can give with specific conditions. You can ask money for it, which could be defendable. Why? Because you have co confidentiality for your code maybe or secret know-how in your source code. Or you can also provide it for free to test on, to see, okay, what are the, the elements that it's improving? But you can also do that under con confidentiality. So it has a lot of options and flexibility to go forward. Now, open source licensing. If you've worked with universities, this is something that a lot of researchers love, but it has a lot of consequences if it's not done right. So this is really, really high level again. So what does it say? So open source licenses, they do not, um, preclude licenses from using the corresponding software commercially. So they say uh, you can use the software, but we have obligations. Um, the permissive ones are very, very kind. They say use the software, whatever you do with it, proprietary, again, under BSD, it's up to you. Just tell that we too made it as an author. The restrictive ones are a little bit trickier. They say, look, you can use our software, but you have to, if you distribute it, it has to be under the same license agreements as us. And mostly that is, you have to make your source code open. So you're opening the confidentiality there. When is that used, for example, the, the GPL? 
it's when, for example, you want to test your software. And probably when that's not your core, oh, sorry. <laughs> that's not your core element uh, going forward. And you also have other open source licensing um, uh, agreements that fall somewhere in between, depending on the nature. Now, a lot of people say like, look, if I open my source code, where is my monetary value then? I open up my, my golden eggs. Now, you have something which is called dual licensing, uh, where you can uh, license one option, one version, proprietary license, so with conditions uh, with respect to the commercial distribution, uh, and also um, uh, with the features that are added, and the other version you can uh, license under a GPL. What is GPL? As I said, you can use it, but you have to make your source code also open. Now, how can you make money by that or valorize your software? Look at MySQL from Oracle. They use a dual licensing approach. So they say, look, everyone has it for free, the GPL model, but if you use GPL, you have to open up everything you, you, you do derive with it and you want to distribute with it. But for those who don't want to make everything open, have that virality in your software code, we also offer it for proprietary, so close. You don't have to open up your improvements, your derivatives. And the, the first one, the GPL license model, they give for free. The other one, you have to pay 10,000 euros for it. So actually, you're um, landing expanding. You're showing, this is what I can do, but if you want your end code to be close and use what I have, you have to pay for it. So at the end, I think we've heard that a lot. First, see what it is you want to do with what. Where in the value chain is your commercialization happening? Are you putting a product on the market yourself? For example, uh, I've had someone come to me and say like, look, we, our core uh, strategy is putting hard hardware on the market, but we've protected the software, which actually isn't that important, with a patent, we have filed stuff, and so, and so over. But then it's, it, it dawned to me, why do you do that? You have to really look, what is my distinctive feature? What is it that I want to put on the market? And also, does my IP protection align with my, uh, with my business plans? And also looking at, it's not because you're in Europe now that in a year or two, you will stay in Europe with your service or product. US law is different than European law. Also look into that as well. Also innovation policies coming forward. And of course, role of intermediary is very, very important to look at. Now, these are some of the exemplary questions to ask when to exploiting. I think I touched uh, on, a, on a lot of them as well. Only one small thing to say as well, with also the publishing, the, the patenting. Um, when you put everything on trade secret, others can still patent it. Why? Because everything which has been novel with respect to publicly available uh, information can still be patented. So that means that if you have a trade secret, you have never made any strategic publications, others can patent it and you're blocked. Some countries will give you uh, a kind of a fallback position there where you can use prior use and very, very detailed documented uh, filings that you have, but that's a risk. For example, big companies like uh, Solvay, like, uh, what is it, Edsberg um, um, as well, they provide strategic publications for elements that they have put in trade secrecy, where they publish on a high level the algorithm, the idea, but they have the, um, the specific implementation of that idea protected by copyright and by trade secret. So again, very important to know what it is that you're doing, what it is you want to do. And I'll just leave you with what I've been uh, telling and also my colleagues. Try to combine a cluster IPRs also with technical and business protection means if possible. Modularity of software is always nice because you can put your core to you and just give others what it is that they specifically need to see. They don't need to see the entire code when they're, when they're uh, working on it, for example. Respect IPRs, it's two-sided importance of contracts early on in the process, also for IP, linked to your strategy, of course, and also build it in function of your business model. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shannon. Uh, we have time for one or two questions. So um, now it's your time to, to ask your question, and uh, let's see uh, who... Um, 
dares to break the ice. No question? I, I, I see a question on the back. So yeah, we have the mic already, so thank you. Yes? Is it working? Yeah. Yes. Um, well, my question was uh, relating with the relationship between the GDPR and the trade secrets, because uh, uh, many in the field of the data protection feel once there is a trade secret, uh, you have to respect it. But here, uh, the speaker was saying precisely the other way around. So is there any recommendations? Uh, yeah. Shannon, uh, I guess this is for you. Okay, uh, I have to define that more specifically. With GDPR, sorry, uh, you, ha you have to um, be able to explain someone what is happening behind the, uh, the interface that you're working for. You don't have to provide all the trade secrets, that's what I mean. But if you already have elements that you don't want people to know, which you have to explain, like for example, uh, one of the GDPR elements is that you need to know what's happening with your data, what kind of a, a process it goes. You don't have to go into detail like with a trade secret. And also with a trade secret, it's more linked to um, specific uh, uh, elements which have a value and which you have protected all the time. It's going to be um, something which probably will not completely overlap, but there's something that you have to think about it, you know, because a lot of people think there is explainability, but you have to be able to do it in a way which is good for you as an IP strategy. So it's not an off on a, um, it's not something which you need to do to open up your trade secret. That's not what I meant. It's something you have to think of in the future because you have to be able to explain what is happening to your data, uh, what is it, the, the data object that you have there. Thank you very much. Other questions I see there, thank you. Uh, good morning. It's not really for a question, but for a, a, a complimentary comments. I'm Sylvain Chappelle. I work for the EPO in Brussels. I'm not an examiner, but just to, to clarify a bit in terms of wording, because I can understand it's not easy for uh, everybody, the wording we employ at the EPO. Uh, the reason why um, um, uh, software, let's say, are not patentable in Europe is that they are con considered as mathematical method. Uh, and theoretical method, like business method, so it's among the exclusions. But what I would like to say is that it's not incompatible to have a protection via copyrights and a protection via patents for the same invention, let's say. You can have the, the software protected via copyrights or open source and let it evolve. And what we protect at the EPO, it's the applications of the software. For instance, I can give you an example. If you have now a washing machine, all are governed by a software. So you cannot patent the software as such, as we said, but you can patent all the applications and technical functions and because they have industrial applications of this. And um, uh, you can also have different applications of this so software evolving. So that's I wanted to add. Thank you very much. Indeed, that's uh, in Europe is not so easy to understand, but nevertheless, I think the flexibility is there. I see another question, please. So it's another another comment. Um, all the speakers have put a big emphasis on ownership, and we also heard about clusters of IP. I just wanted to um, extend that a little bit because most uh, collaborative projects uh, not only produce jointly owned IP but in order to address the issues, lots of different bits of IP need to come together. Um, so as well as thinking about clustering different types of IP around an invention, so for example, patent, copyright, know-how might apply to a single invention, you will have to bring several inventions together to bundle them in, in, the order, product, in yeah. order to address the uh, issues and get it to market. Indeed, indeed. It's not as simple as just one protection or one invention. Thank you. Do I see other comments? No, but let me then finish perhaps with a, with a personal experience. Um, I think if in, even in a company and even more in a university and, and research institute, if you can, can do something in, you know, to advance about this one, is to do a training or to have, uh, let's say, periodic and readily assistance available, not only about the patent and how to, but, but even before that, what 
you can patent and how to discover things that you can patent. I think that, that because a lot of times, you know, you may not realize that the ideas that you have come with is innovative and can or even should be protected. And, and, and I think there, the, the relatively, I would say, small investment of you know, raising awareness, whether a guide, whether a training, or a, just a, 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 a weekly you know, person passing by and, and having a chat or, or knowing this, uh, might be a valuable uh, invention. And um, I worked for quite year, some years as a, as an, in R&D, and I never had these kind of things. And once uh, I, I get into a, a brainstorming meeting trying to, to resolve an issue, a difficult issue about uh, broadcast and availability, and I came with a solution. Um, I was test engineer at that time. And, and then my colleague that was from, uh, from system or from architecture said, wow, this is a great idea, actually. It, it may work. And you know what? Uh, uh, you can even uh, you know, protect it. So I say, wow, that's great. Uh, you can do it because I know that you have some plans. You say, no, no, I finished my plan for, for this year. Uh, and and, and just, just go and talk to these guys uh, to, in this office. And I, it's very strange because I was passing every day to that office was saying something like IP and, you know, being, a, a, um, let's say, a um, telecommunication engineer, I always thought IP it means internet protocol. And, uh, and, and then I, I, I knock on that door and I discover a completely new world of uh, specialists and patent attorney, etc. And in no time, I have uh, had, I have had the patent on my name, okay, and, and even, and even al alone, and talking about employment contracts, then I remember that so many years before I just signed almost by not watching uh, a lot of papers when I, when, I, when I started, and one of them was about IP, and then I, uh, they told me, well, you know, you signed that, it cannot be your patent, your patent will be owned by a company, and then by a company, so, um, yeah, okay, I got some, uh, some, some small amount of money, uh, and even more important, I can put that on my CV. So, you know, another, mo another motivation for you might be that uh, if you are a, an, an owner of a patent or several patents, it may help you on your CV. And now, meantime, I'm reading a lot of CVs, uh, even more lately with uh, program managers. And I can tell you that each time that I see uh, I'm owner of uh, one or two, sometimes even seven or, or more patents, I always um, you know, appreciate that and say, okay, this person compared with hundreds of other CVs that do not have it, it, it makes a difference, okay? So this being uh, said, I thank you very much for attending this session. I hope it was useful. Thank, and please help me to thank our speakers. Thank you very much.